Bom dia a todos e a todas. Good morning to all. We are um, now going to start our final session uh, and uh, I want to welcome you all to uh, this final day of our meeting. We had a very full and productive day yesterday and also this morning with very inspiring presentations that I'm sure have contributed to further our reflexive and critical knowledge. We are very pleased to have organized this moment of tribute to Eric Holland Wright, whose work had influenced so many studies developed here and at the Center for Social Studies. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank all the people involved, namely uh, Alexandra, um, Inês and Anna from SESH, whose professionalism never ceases to surprise us, and also to the students of Multidistante de Sociologia for their availability to be here with us, even though they are in the middle of exams and evaluations. I'm very pleased to... <laughs> I'm very pleased. I'm very pleased to be here today to present Professor Boaventura de Sousa Santos, whose work is also an inspiration to us all, and who actually challenges us to organize this tribute about a year ago. He needs no introduction, it is sure, but I'll do a small presentation anyway. Boaventura de Sousa Santos is an emeritus professor of sociology at the University of Coimbra and distinguished legal scholar at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is the founder and director emeritus of the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra and has written and published widely on the issues of globalization, sociology of law and state, human rights, epistemology, democracy, social movements and the World Social Forum in several languages. He has such a wide list of publications that it isn't easy to select some to mention. In fact, initially I thought to mention here only the most recent books, but uh, published in 2000, 2019, but there are 14, so... Um, uh, despite that, I want to highlight uh, two recent books that I believe are particularly relevant for those attending this meeting. Um, the End of the Cognitive Empire, The Coming Age of Epistemologies of the South, and o Pluriverso dos Direitos Humanos, a Diversidade das Lutas pela Dignidade. He has already been distinguished with several awards from highly prestigious universities, and today he is going to talk to us about uh, real utopias and emancipation challenges. Thank you, Madalena, for this wonderful introduction. Um, thank you very much for being here. Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here with you, particularly in this uh, uh, event that we decide to organize the, the day after uh, our dear friend uh, uh, Eric Orenbrey passed away. And in fact, this is one of many of the tributes. Uh, myself and Guy, we have been going to be together in Purple Island in June uh, for July uh, for the meeting of the International Sociological Association in which there will be also a panel on Eric's work. Um, and I'm very pleased that uh, this work of course is going to be nice and very well known what will, but in any case it's good to have these sessions and particularly for us that we're very good friends. Of Eric, I arrived in, uh, in Madison in, for the first time in 1981 um, and after the short pause uh, for a couple of years in which I was doing uh, research, field research in Cape Verde Islands, I, um, I returned to Madison and for the following uh, 35 years I would spend the full term in Madison from August to December and uh, Eric was one of my best friends all along. And we discussed uh, uh, lots of things over the years. We would go to a, a very popular uh, student restaurant on State Street, Sun Room, and uh, we would discuss uh, uh, 
our topics, and there were differences between the two of us. There were differences and um, different styles probably also. The fact that I was very much concerned with the struggles in the South, I was very committed from 2000 onwards with World Social Forum. Eric never managed uh, to be too involved in the World Social Forum. But it was uh, interesting is that uh, 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 we went through a very interesting evolution is that uh, uh, his uh, <clears throat> initial, as, as Gay mentioned yesterday, focus on analytical philosophy and uh, the uh, intention of development out of it, a uh, very rigorous form of, uh, of uh, Marxian thinking and uh, Marxian uh, science, uh, uh, totally, absolutely rigorous uh, science that would match all the, the, the standards and criteria, methodological criteria and criteria of truth validation that were typical of the northern epistemologists or the epistemologists of the north, I, I would come to call them. Uh, and then there was a difference there, of course. I, I, I was much more interested in seeing the, uh, discussing the epistemologists and questioning the, the dominant epistemologists from very early on. But then I came back from 1981, from my first, 1989, from my first field research in Porto Alegre on participatory budgeting. And uh, all of a sudden, Eric was very curious about it. Oh, I want to know more about that. And uh, we started talking about the participatory budget, 1989. And then in the following years, I continued to go to Porto Lab to finish this research. In fact, over the uh, second, the first part of the 90s, and I eventually published an, uh, a book here in Portugal, and in Brazil, and in Spain, Democracia uh, Participação, uh, and in the United States, in his journal, The Politics in Society, I published a very long article, one of those articles that we don't publish anymore in journals, um, in 1998. Uh, but it, uh, specifically on participatory budgeting. So one could see that uh, uh, Eric was really moving into uh, these initiatives, concrete uh, uh, initiatives that were not so abstract as the highly abstract uh, theorizing of the non-bullshit uh, Marxists, which never convinced me. I think I was I saw a lot of bullshit in that, I have to say. <laughs> so I, 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 that was our discussions. We discussed it this way, but it was a really uh, fascinating with, uh, to discuss with such a sweet person. So what I'm going to do is, is, is uh, to, to, to give you my idea on the questions of utopia, and I do that as a tribute to, to, to Eric. But we'll see if you know Eric's work. You know our differences, our commonalities, and I think that's the way we should do uh, in order to pursue the social sciences. It's just this dialogue uh, where colleagues with which we have so much in common, but uh, uh, with which we also, we also disagree in sometimes in fundamental ways. I mean, the, the title that I propose for this talk is a little bit cumbersome. Uh, that's why I give you the a better title, uh, which is uh, basically the following. The alternative to utopia is myopia. Uh, and uh, this is the title of, the, of, in fact, of my first uh, class of this semester. So I'm going to give it in advance, even though I'm going to talk about different things when my class is here, at this uh, precise the same location, uh, take place uh, uh, from March onwards. So, because I think that the utopia has been a topic that has interested me for a long, long time. Uh, and um, in fact, when I wrote Toward the New Common Sense in 1995, there was one of the debates at the time with, uh, with Eric, and then it came out in the Critica de Razão do Land in Portuguese. The last chapter was Don't Shoot the Utopist. And uh, I was trying to defend the idea of utopia because the uh, utopia had been really uh, very, very demonized from the middle mid-century onwards, particularly by Karl Popper, uh, Isaac Berlin, and many others, 
uh, in the 50s, as, as the utopia was always totalitarian, was wrong, despotic, as we should. That's the beginning of the liberal ideology uh, that was uh, being developed, particularly in the UK and then the United States. But, but then this, uh, this, um, and this uh, uh, supposed uh, death of, uh, of utopia was short-lived, because then comes 1968, the student movement, and all of a sudden, utopia is on the streets. And therefore, this anti-utopian thinking goes away uh, and recedes uh, quite, uh, quite a lot. Even though there are always debates on this, but then comes 1989, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it looks like that after that, uh, that is the final end of utopian thinking. And uh, in fact, the end of history uh, Fukuyama's book is really uh, basically uh, the epitaph for utopia, so to say. So the idea was that probably utopia was, uh, uh, was there by then, but I was never, never convinced because I felt that uh, it is one of the characteristics of Western modernity uh, that uh, utopia is always present and will always be present uh, given the forms of domination that take place in our societies. And since human beings, communities, collectivities are organized to resist, they don't desist, they don't give up. Sometimes they are more hopeful, sometimes they are less hopeful. But nevertheless, they never accept the real as the only reality. Uh, they really think that the part of reality is the possible. The possible is the part of our reality, and therefore there is only space for utopia. Uh, thinking. But it, it is true that the, the hostility to the idea of, of, uh, of utopia was very clear. And when I wrote the, the 1995 book, I was very much aware of that. And in fact, uh, it came from different uh, areas. Uh, it was not just Isaac Berlin, Berlin or uh, Karl Popper or many others at the time. There were also, of course, the, the Marxist tradition, because the Marxist tradition has been developed on a kind of an anti-utopian stance, and that was that anti-utopian stance that, in fact, uh, 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 Eric Orrin Wright represented in the first part of his career. And so it was really actively hostile to the idea of utopian, because it was not rigorous, because it was not scientific. Um, so I think that, uh, and Gay mentioned that uh, uh, very well, but that's why it is very interesting why uh, in the second half of his uh, life, and their career professional life, in fact, uh, they, uh, Eric Colin Wright starts to write about the real utopias. So it is my, my idea that this presence, this compulsive presence, presence of utopia, even though it will be suppressed for a while, it comes up again, and will come again on, on as long as there is capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. So I think that uh, uh, what I'm trying to do is to see whether it is possible to overcome this hostility between knowledge and utopia. Uh, knowledge, particularly scientific knowledge, and utopia, because I really see that from the liberal side and from the Marxist side, there has always been this uh, uh, hostility. In fact, Michael Bourevoy, at the end of the book, uh, uh, How to be an anti-capitalist in the 21st century, by Eric Allen Wright, he wrote a beautiful postface, and in his postface, uh, he summarizes brilliantly the, uh, the antagonisms uh, in Eric Allen Wright's work, uh, that he refers as the conundrum of Eric Allen Wright's work. And the conundrum is the following, and I cite, namely his move from class analysis without utopias to utopias without class analysis. And that's the way I think it is, it's a fair, it's a fair uh, representation of the conundrum uh, inhabiting uh, uh, Eric Wright's uh, way. So what I think is that these I have hostility uh, of science vis-a-vis -vis utopia is a very long, long one. As I said, it's even before the liberal uh, science in social sciences. Uh, I always mention 1841 text by uh, Charles Fourier, 
uh, in which he uh, produces a very vicious attack against the philosophers of the uncertain sciences. Uh, and they are the social sciences. And, and the reason for this attack is the following. Why these people concentrate on small things and they leave out the fundamental problems? The problems, the fundamental contradictions, the ones that touch our lives, the ones that control our future, our happiness, our right to a just society. All these problems never come up in these uh, philosophers of uncertain uh, science. They had this odd property that focusing on the small things and leaving out the big things. It is very interesting because many decades later, almost one century later, a very conservative philosopher, uh, Leo Strauss, uh, uh, said almost the same. That our culture is based on this, retail sanity and the wholesale madness. Basically the same idea, and coming from a very conservative uh, um, philosopher. So I think that uh, this idea that these deeply embedded problems have no way of being dealt with uh, in, uh, in scientific uh, ways uh, that live out always for poetry, for literature, or for uh, utopia, uh, the same uh, these questions of, uh, of, uh, of utopia. It is true, however, that for Fourier, it was not the case. Uh, for Fourier, in fact, he saw uh, that the critique that he uh, really did against, uh, made against all these philosophers of uncertain sciences was based on the belief that we could really produce a science of utopia. And we could produce better than this a scientifically organized utopia. And in fact, it is all his books uh, on the design of utopia are scientific in all the, the details. They are the phalansteres, the phalansteres. If you read the phalansteres, you can see that how, uh, for instance, the communities are divided up. The number, the exact number of people that each one has to be composed of. So it was this idea of this belief that science could encompass uh, Utopia. But that was very modernist, by the way. I think that modern science was forever hostile to Utopia. And therefore, only a critique of science, only an epistemological break with this modern science, could really rescue Utopia for our debates. And I go back to one of the most brilliant sociologists of our time, of this century, and uh, particularly not very optimist, on the contrary, usually considered to be a very pessimistic one, is Max Weber. When Max Weber says that the only way of thinking and struggling for the possible is to have a vision of the impossible. These passages never, never, was mentioned or touched upon by Talbot Parsons. <laughs> Never. But it was crucial for 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 for, for Weber. But Weber, it was very clear that unless you have a vision of the impossible, you cannot <coughs> struggle for for the possible. So I think it was uh, Max Weber in this way was my my guideline. Even though my training was as a Marxist, I I I, I could see that he was right there. And he was right there also because of this critique of modern science. He was also very skeptical about the rationality of science. That's why he, he really tried to deal with so many forms of rationality. As you know, in Max Weber, there are four forms of rationality. There, there is something irrational about so many rationalities, quite frankly. And I think that was the problem that Weber was trying to, to uh, address at this point in time. So I think that if you would really try to bring utopia into our conversation uh, in the social movements as well as in the academic life, I think it would be necessary to have an epistemological break with modern science, where these northern epistemologists, as I call them, uh, and then, for sure, if you would do that, probably utopia 
would not look like the same way. That is to say, a change in the scientific outlook and perspective would also change utopia. <coughs> and this is the, what I'm going to propose to you is this the convergence, uh, the superseding of two very desperate fields into a new field, but it's not a synthesis in Hegelian terms, it's something completely new. Actually, because both the thesis and the antithesis have to be totally transformed before they enter in a kind of, uh, of a synthesis. So I think that if you want to start thinking about that, you have to think that probably we need a radical understanding of the possible. Let's go back to, to Weber. You need probably a radical understanding of the possible so that the impossible comes into our vision. And if you don't have, if you have really a short range uh, understanding of the possible, that is to say a non-radical understanding of current society, then you will be trained for short-sightedness. We'll be trained to see just the short-range things. We don't see the long-term things. We don't see the big things. And that's why they are an object of madness. And if many people, particular political leaders, take over power, this madness can be quite dangerous. And we are seeing precisely what's happening in, uh, in this way. So I think that this radical uh, uh, understanding has to come from a different conception of science. Am I saying that Marx science, Marx science is not radical enough? Yes, I am saying that. And I am saying that, why? I am saying that because we have two types of science in our modern world, social sciences, I would say, this is what I have dealt with the models of science and, and philosophy of science in other in other contexts. But this and these are ones and, and, and that, that I want to really distinguish very clearly. One is the knowledge and the science that comes after the struggle. You can see that the concept of struggle becomes a very important concept for me. This is Hegel. Hegel says that the knowledge in fact Minerva settles down at the end of the struggle. And only at the end of the struggle, when all the ashes are calmed down, you can see, start seeing and building knowledge. What is the problem with this conception? Is that after the struggle, only the knowledge of the winners is there. The knowledge of the losers is not there anymore. They have been vanquished in the struggle. They are there as a ruin, and we are not doing ruins in this, in this sense. So the knowledge that comes after the struggle could never, in a sense, be a good knowledge for utopia, because if the winners have won, then why do they need utopia? <laughs> they have conquered whatever they want. They know it. Who needs utopia? That will be the following question. But look at Marx. Marx's science is just the opposite. It's knowledge before the struggle. What Marx wants to do is to prepare the working class for a very efficacious, efficient struggle against capitalism in the name of a future of a classless society. It is, in fact, a knowledge built as a theory before the struggle to inform the struggle, and that's why we talk about vanguard theory. It is vanguard theory because it's before the practice, right? So, and here, again, if we do that, who has this theory? Are the people that are struggling? No. They are the people that are thinking about the struggles, but not probably the real people that are so I, I've been thinking you know, all my, in the last 20 years, that probably we should find us an alternative to this too. And the alternative are knowledge is born in struggle. And these are the Epistemologists of the South. The Epistemologists of the South are all the procedures for the validations of knowledges 
born in struggle against the militia. And uh, in this case, I have to start from the idea that the people in struggle produce knowledge. Knowledge is not just produced at our universities. Knowledge is not produced what is in the books. Knowledge is produced in such a life and is produced by those that are resisting the against the munition. Of course, our role in social scientists is precious, but we are not the avant-garde. We are the guardians of the knowledge, in a sense. We are the guardians, the facilitators, the processors, <coughs> the ones that can help to expand the meaning of, that, of those struggles, of those knowledges that are born in struggle. And if you do that, then you can start from the perspective of these struggles. And the concept of the struggle becomes central. And if you look really at all the sociology tradition, struggle has never been a key concept in our social sciences. Social change, of course, social transformation, but not struggle. Struggle is something different. Because struggle is bodies and not just ideas is an embodied in the very deepest sense of the world. So I think that we have to, if you want to go to beyond the retail thinking of uh, social sciences, we have to start understanding this knowledge is born in struggle. And once you look, and what I'm going to propose to you is that if we start uh, analyzing these struggles from the perspective of the people that are resisting, and I had, of course, for me, one the school of my life in my second part of my, of my career was the World Social Forum. I could see that the struggles there were not just the class struggle, or not just the workers. Actually, the workers were absent from the first World Social Forum in Porto Alegre in 2001. It was the struggles of women, the struggles of the Afro-descendants, of indigenous people, of ecologists, of human rights, uh, activists of the Dalits, of so many people that feel oppressed, discriminated against by the forms of domination. So you could see that uh, the ambit of the struggles is much broader. And uh, the class struggle is very important, but it is in the context of the struggles. And here we can start thinking that if this is a variety of struggles, probably it calls for a different conception of domination. And that's why I came to the conclusion that we have really a domination from the very beginning, from the 17th century, based on the three forms of domination, capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. And they are articulated. And I'm going to show from a Marxist point of view, by the way, not from a non-Marxist, I don't need Durkheim in that, for that, I think that we can stick to Marx to explain why this is this way. We have these three forms of domination. And they work in tandem, an inarticulation. And therefore the people are struggling, are struggling against them, sometimes against one of them, sometimes against another. But the domination in itself has these three heads. There are many heads, of course. The caste system in India, religious fundamentalism, also in many places, um, uh, ableism. But I think that these are what I call satellite uh, dominations. They usually work together with the main three forms of domination. If you look at that very closely, you can see that the people struggling are going to be analyzing the different perspectives. What is the different perspectives? Is that some form of domination, capitalism, presupposes the full humanity of the people oppressed, exploited. The workers are free because uh, the, their bodies are not sold. What is sold are, is the labor power, not the bodies, right? So they are fully human. They are equal citizens. They are the French Revolution, equal citizens before the law. <coughs> That's capitalism. 
But look at colonialism and patriarchy. No. For capitalism and patriarchy, people are not equal. They are really subhuman. Women, black people, indigenous people, have always been considered subhuman. And therefore, there is an ontological degradation here. And here, in fact, because there is an ontological degradation, yes, their bodies can be sold. Their bodies can be sold. Slave labor, of course, but not just only slave labor. Analogous to slave labor, women, etc. So we can see that uh, there is here what I call an abyss of life. A fraction in our domination is that one sector, one dimension of domination, accepts the full equality among people, the formal equality of people as humans, while the other two, the other two, they don't accept that. They transform those in subhumans. So our societies are divided between humans and subhumans. And the mistake, the error, I think, that much of the Marxist thinking was precisely to think that the end of historical colonialism was the processes of, the processes of independence. The idea that when independence Colonialism was over, and therefore, from now on, the struggle will be against capitalism. Look uh, at the way in which Mariate, the great Marxist from Peru, was reprimanded by the Marxists of, of the Comintern. Colonialism was over. Well, we have to take into account, if you look at the perspectives, because working with indigenous people, in my case, or afro descendants people in Latin America, in Brazil, and many other countries, for them, it's absolutely clear that societies are colonialists. Colonialism is not over. They are victims of racism every day. They are victims of ontological degradation. They are considered the discardable populations all the way. Their land is expropriated. They are expelled from their land as the colonialists did before. So they are not really human. They are subhumans, and therefore, they cannot really be dealt with with the same instruments that we develop for full humanity. That's capitalism. So now you ask me, you ask me but why is that? For a very simple reason. The end of historical capitalism, the colonialism, that is to say, the end of colonialism by occupation by a foreign country, that's historical colonialism, is not the historical end of colonialism. As I used there to think that the end of historical socialism is not the historical end of socialism. So we have to distinguish different types of things. Some disappear and continue under new forms. Now if you look at this, at this uh, idea that in fact Humanity as full humanity is not anything in our reality. Because under capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy, there is no humanity without subhumanity. There is no humanity without people being in zones of sacrifice that are there because that's why they can be drowned in the Mediterranean. That's why they can be put in concentration camps even if they have children. In the, in the great democratic countries, the United States? Because they are, they are not really people. They are not really people. So I think that if you pay, pay that into your, put that in perspective, you could start thinking that probably, if you want to understand society in this way, you can see who needs utopia. Who needs utopia? For what purposes? I think that utopia is needed by the ones that are most marginalized, dominated, excluded by the forms of modern domination. That is to say, by, cap by colonialism and by patriarchy, side by side with capitalism. And why do I say that? That they are three modes of of domination that work together for a very, we don't have to abandon the labor theory of value. 
we have to consider that one thing is capitalism as an ideal type. The other thing is uh, capitalism as a social phenomenon. The free labor does not sustain itself, neither politically nor socially, without non-paid labor, <coughs> without highly developed labor. It is colonialism and patriarchy that produce non-paid labor and highly developed labor. You, you see that in, in, in relation to non-paid labor by women, you see that in civil federation. But there are many others that they've been dealing with. So we need, that's why free labor doesn't go together with slave light -like labor. And that's why in spite of all the agreements against slavery, all the treaties against slavery, look at the data from the United Nations, labor analogous to slavery is growing everywhere. Why is that? And why it is said analogous? Because the United Nations is an organization of states, and the states have abolished slavery, and therefore they cannot admit that there is slavery in their countries. That's why they say analogous to slavery. But look at the people. Put the, in the perspective of the people that are suffering these kinds of work, of labor. They are slaves, of course. So, free slavery does go without unfree slave. So unfree labor. And therefore, it is really this uh, idea that calls for this standard. What is the drama of our society? is that while domination works in tandem, the resistance against this domination is fragmented. How many anti-capitalist movements have been racist and have been sexist? How many anti-colonial movements have been capitalists and sexist? How many feminist movements have been racist and capitalist? So if capitalism, patriarchy and colonialism work together, there is no way of getting out of this hell if we don't integrate anti-capitalists with anti-colonialists with anti-ethropatriarchal struggles. And they have to be integrated. It doesn't mean that all of us are going to struggle in all of those types of struggles. We may really be more involved in one or the other, but we have to have the broad scope of all the struggles. Look, look at the women in Chile now. Why are they die proposing the post-colonial, the, the, the plurinational constitutional assembly? These women are working fully aware of the fact that if we put them down, they are now the a predominant social movement in Chile, they bring along the indigenous struggle. And that's why they call for a constitutional assembly that is uh, uh, plurinational. That's Mapuche, the Mapuche type of idea. So I think that if we manage to do that, you can see that probably are the radically excluded people that need utopia. And utopia is an aim. Fuel humanity. Big fuel human. And then the difficult start here. Yeah. I always look at the real utopias of uh, of, uh, of uh, Eric, and I had once a, a long discussion with him about that, is that the real utopias were designed for the people that live in what I call the metropolitan sociability, the ones that are fully human. It wouldn't work the same way for the people that live under colonial sociability. Those that this capitalist, colonialist, and patriarchal society does not consider them fully human. So you should have to develop utopia for these other classes. So it was the idea, myself, I was doing the participatory budgeting, but the participatory budgeting was really within the framework of equal free people. But it was not the other side of the line, of the Risa line. And so you would need another type of utopia for these people. So I think that you cannot transpose from one to the other. And what, uh, what, what uh, uh, the real utopians were doing, and it was very well done, brilliant done by Eric Wright, 
corresponded exactly to what Andre Gors called the revolutionary reforms. They were the inspiration for Eric, actually. Because between this, this uh, dichotomy between reformism and the revolution, Andre Gors, a great intellectual, French intellectual, that was well known by, by, by Eric, uh, developed the idea of revolutionary reforms. There are small things that prefigure the big things of a different society, prefigure a society that is post-capitalist. It is true that André was not very concerned with patriarchy, nor with racism or colonialism, but in any case, this idea was there. So if you have this in mind, then we can say, why is it so difficult to think about utopia? As you can see by the, the, the scientific conceptions that you have been uh, considered preponderant, it is very difficult to imagine the utopia out of this kind of science. If you see that our science, social sciences, this, this, uh, this uh, uh, odd uh, property sciences as a Fourier uh, would say, if, if they will recognize this fracture, this wound, that today the post-colonial studies call the colonial wound, that's the fracture between the civilized zones of the world and the colonial zones of the world. If you see that, then you can see that the science may help to develop a different utopia. But then the utopia is probably different from the one that was conceived of as a kind of a monolithic uh, utopia. And we'll see what kind of utopia can be built on this process. But before that, it's very important. Why utopia is so important now? For a very simple reason again, is because with neoliberalism, it started in fact with Popper, with all the, Isaiah Berlin, a great intellectual by the way, but it started with them. But it was the idea of separating the political processes from the civilizatory processes. That was the idea. One thing is the civilizatory or civilizational process, the other thing is the political and therefore we are going to depoliticize the political because the big things, the big questions of the civilization are not dealt with because after all there is no alternative. You see, so this separation between the political process and the civilizatory process is what then Eric Wright is going to consider a very insightful idea of the relation between values and politics. He says in that book also, that now we are in a situation in which we have values without politics and politics without values. And who is taking over values now in political life? The extreme right and religious fundamentalism. And that the consequence of living out from the political process, the civilizatory anxiety, the zeitgeist that is also a Weltschmerz, so to say, that we left it out comes in now through the extreme right and to religious fundamentalism. So, and we should not be surprised because we ourselves abandon the idea of values totally. So I think that if you take this into account, then you can say that it is in fact, the utopia is fruitful humanity. And in fact, all the struggles will be very different. The processes, the utopia, is in the process of conducting the struggle for an anti-capitalist, anti-colonialist, and anti-patriarchal society. The utopia is more procedural than substantive. We always try to develop what is the substantive profile of utopia. You never pay attention to the procedural. Because even in the Marxist thinking, we are very much trained to listen nefarious idea that the end justify the means. And that's why you don't pay attention to this thing. So if you take into account this procedural utopia, then how does it put, look like the bits of substantive utopia that you could uh, uh, develop? As you can see, the, events, the idea of the diversity of, of domination all comes from diversity of people, of Asians, 
Of course, there are classes, there are races, gender, there are struggles from different types. All of them are important, even though some may be more urgent than others. This is the most difficult aspect of critical thinking, is to accept that all these struggles are important, even though some may be more important than others, and more urgent, more urgent than others. If in a Brazilian city they start killing, assassinating the trans, the trans people, of course in that city is a very urgent struggle to defend the life of the trans people. Doesn't mean that is the most important struggle. Equally important, but differently urgent considering the different contexts. So if you think that the full humanity comes out of struggle, then two issues come immediately. First, what comes of humanity? If you bring the knowledges of the people that are in struggle, they are not necessarily West-centric West -centric or Eurocentric knowledge. They are indigenous knowledges, African knowledges, Asian knowledges, different concepts of humanity. For instance, for indigenous people, the full humanity includes nature, the Mother Earth. So humanity, you cannot speak of full humanity without respect for nature. <coughs> what means the present humanity, the living humanity? Well, again, we have problems. Because for us Eurocentric people, the living are the living and the dead are the dead. But look at the indigenous of the Afrin cosmovisions, the ancestors, the spirits. The ancestors are the living dead. They live with us, even though for us they seem to be dead, but not to them. So the ambit of the living is much broader than from the Western thinking. And believe me, don't think that this, our knowledge, the Eurocentric knowledge is dominant. But it's not hegemonic. If you go around the world, more people in the world believe in their ancestors as living dead than many people don't believe in that. And many people are connected to nature in a way that you cannot imagine. And here, again, the interculturality, which is absolutely fundamental for the epistemology of the self, brings you another idea about nature. Because it's, it's important that capitalism, separates totally the individual, the human, from that from nature, because nature is to be dominated, of course. But look at the colonialism and patriarchy. Colonialism brings together nature and human beings. In the colonial thinking, the indigenous people were nature. Well, in Hobbes, in the Leviathan, they are called the naturals. They were nature. And in fact, patriarchy always considers women to be closer to nature than men. Whatever is closer to nature is inferior. That's the logic of modernity. So we have to rescue from other non-Western conceptions, but non-Western conceptions, the respect for nature, not for this nature as a degrading object, but on the contrary, is the human that sustains humanity is the non-human that sustains the human. And here, not surprising for many people that know my word, I have to come back to Spinoza. When Spinoza says, Deus sive natura. Now I paraphrase, I paraphrase uh, Spinoza, the human that is nature. If you look at this in this way, you can envisage a form of liberation of utopia that in fact may guide the struggles because if you in a situation of the final time of the Anthropocene where the ecological crisis of this dimension if you don't include in the human uh, utopia the non-human nature because it's the sustainability of the human this holistic conception will never really achieve the impossible that we need, as Max Weber taught us, to fight efficiently the possible for the possible today. So the utopia is the not yet, 
of Ed's law is the sociology of emergencies, they call it. That's what it is. Is it not yet? And you never reach it there. So the utopia is never to be fulfilled. It's the way of the struggling for the possible with a vision of the impossible. Thank you very much.